next workshop, I'm very excited to present Jayanti Surya Narayana. Jayanti is a senior principal software engineer with specialization in synthetic tabular data. She's a technical lead with domain experience in healthcare, retail, and technology. Her areas of expertise include enterprise data management, AI strategy, and ML engineering. Her workshop today is titled Introduction to Synthetic Data and Its Goodness Measurement. She would pause for questions during the interim and uh, welcome Jayanti, over to you. Thank you, Dibajana, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for choosing to spend the next one, year, one hour um, to learn about this uh, uh, synthetic uh, data, especially synthetic tablet data. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, uh, today's topic as Benchna mentioned is synthetic tabular data and goodness measure. Again, pay attention to the middle one that is synthetic tabular data. And uh, some of, uh, uh, I'm glad that the uh, presentation before me was about the um, uh, data pre-processing because the second part of this presentation, which is goodness of measure, ties very well into the techniques for understanding how good the synthetic data is using the uh, techniques explained by uh, Is Isidora. So with that, uh, let's get uh, started. Okay. Um, uh, 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 Dibanjana uh, kindly introduced me, but I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about my journey and how I chanced upon uh, into the synthetic data and uh, why I, uh, I become more passionate about it and want not to share my knowledge, whatever I have learned with a broader audience as well. So I am an electronics engineer by training and I started um, uh, to pivot my career into software engineering early on. I worked on a number of projects, programs in app development, been in the data space for a, a while and uh, handled big data uh, or you know, all the challenges you face handling uh, um, you know, uh, challenges of the data applications. And later on, uh, on my journey to deep learning and machine learning, uh, I got introduced to uh, reading papers. And um, I want to just kind of tell that many of my uh, examples, et cetera, primarily will be in healthcare. I, I have been in healthcare for a while. So naturally that thing comes up, but uh, I got introduced to reading papers um, like deep patient, deep doctor, et cetera, from research institutions. And then uh, I was curious to uh, see if I can reproduce uh, that particular um, you know, uh, research paper and understand a little bit more about that architecture, et cetera. But I just couldn't get to the data at all. Um, you know, a data sharing is a big, big challenge. And uh, you, it, 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 most of the people who are working on the AI and ML projects spend a lot of time uh, just to get access to the data. And it was uh, really very frustrating that uh, I've learned all the new algorithms. I want to try on new things, but it was very, very difficult even to do my projects, works and all to get um, uh, data. And, uh, and researching the solutions, um, I found that uh, synthetic data is one of the you know uh, potential solutions for that problem. And of course, it was a uh, four or five year, four years back I got started and the industry has advanced and the ecosystem is now uh, flush with a number of vendors, et cetera. And I'm going to share my journey on this uh, synthetic data space um, uh, with you guys. And uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions um, you may have. And of course, outside of work, I enjoy doing yoga and you can also ask me questions about yoga as well <laughs> later on if you like, but with that, what we are going to do in the next one hour. First, we want to set a context um, around what AI and the generative technologies are. Especially, I'm going to spend a little bit time on the term AI itself because it's a term which is used too much, too much hype, and we do need to get our head around as what does this, what is it that um, they are meaning at the context which you are in, meaning if you are reading a paper, is it a marketing hype or is it 
uh, if we are looking at a brochure or you know capturing uh, titles on the YouTubes, etc. That term is super widely used now, and we want to understand the context around that. The next, we will uh, talk through what synthetic tablet data is and a kind of a context and intuition. And we'll go through the use cases for that. And we'll go through how the hows of that. Uh, what are the tools, what technologies and platforms, et cetera. The last but not the least is the goodness measure concepts. Uh, and this is, okay, now you generated synthetic data, but what now? How do I know where can I use it? How good it is? How can I quantify that? So we'll talk about some of the con uh, concepts around that. And I want to um, uh, say that this is still an area of research, uh, but the techniques are quite mature. And I'll kind of talk about that uh, as we get there. And then I'll open it for Q&A. But we'll also, uh, uh, in between the four and five, which is the natural break between the generation and the measurement. We'll also pass for questions if there are any. So AI and its implied meaning, a timeline view. So um, AI is really nothing new per se. The term itself was coined by John McCarthy in 1956. Uh, so um, I guess many, many of us might not have been born around that time also. Then in 1980s, uh, we got, we got uh, around 1980s, not this is just a rough uh, timeline. Uh, the AI initially was all rule-based and um, primarily known as symbolic AI. And we had the first conversational uh, expert system uh, called Eliza from MIT, where it would answer questions for you uh, on the healthcare. It was kind of pretending or, or you know imitating a doctor type of a scenario there. So we did have that kind of a conversational concept um, early on, uh, even as early as 1970s, et cetera. But the real deal is that it was a symbolic AI and it is a rule based. And then came the paradigm shift, um, which is machine learning. And machine learning is again, a subset of AI. And it is essentially you are learning from the data. So um, around late 90s, uh, that picked up so much uh, because we were also going through uh, the internet revolution and internet was accessible for so many people. And so we were generating a lot of data as well. So the field of machine learning is essentially learning from the data. And initially we were using mostly the statistical model. But it is very interesting to know between 1970s and 1990s, you were not supposed to utter the word AI. It was called period of AI winter. And at that time, mostly the, it was not available for common folks, but only for academicians and probably defense research, et cetera. And the, um, uh, it did not promise the value uh, as it, uh, as it uh, said in the beginning. So, that was a period of AI winter, and uh, you know it was always the projects were reframed, and uh, um, you know the research were uh, done. Um, funding was really hard to get, etc. And after 2000, uh, you know uh, we had that internet revolution, we had that uh, hardware uh, research and acceleration, and then the cloud computing making it accessible. And uh, not only it is accessible, it is also affordable for many. Then came the era of supervised learning, primarily recommendation engines, etc. But AI just meant supervised learning. Although there were many, many subsections and sub uh, algorithms there, but whenever you see AI in a generic uh, term, it always meant supervised learning that picked up so much. Initially, they were uh, mostly, um, you know, um, uh, statistical and decision tree like that. But then we started seeing the beginnings of the neural network. And the neural network started promising, showing its promise in various research areas. So initially, we had uh, research not as a combined one, but, you know, we had vision, NLP, et cetera. But what was kind of the common underground uh, underlying uh, algorithm was a uh, neural network. The thing was, it was really very simple uh, from the point of view of 
the architecture that you have many layers, you can keep on adding layers and each layer can, you can have many number of neurons in it. And the uh, computation itself, it is compute intensive, but the computation itself is pretty simple at every neuron. And that uh, technology promised that that's the only uh, that algorithm where if you feed more and more data, you could get higher and higher performance compared to uh, your other statistical models, etc. So then we saw that uh, um, you know uh, a equivalence of AI term equal to supervised learning to AI means deep learning network. So that became in 2015. And then came a uh, very fancy uh, uh, neural network architecture called GANS. And that is again the start of the generative AI in the deep learning space. And uh, probably all of you know about during the last election cycle about that deep fake technology playing an important role. Um, and now we, I mean, everybody has concern about that as well, uh, around that, uh, how we are, we are able to reproduce near real like images, near real like voices, et cetera. And of course, now with chat GPT rolled out um, uh, end of last year, now AI is equal to LLMs. Uh, although LLMs have been there for a while, say like four or five years ever since uh, the neural, uh, in, uh, neural network picked up, but the great in, uh, innovation uh, which happened was they combined the human feedback reinforcement learning and also uh, rolled it out to consumer. So whether you have a PhD degree or whether you are a high school person who has, uh, you know, who, who, who have, you are in the digital world, you have the chance to kind of give feedback and influence uh, that was really the turning point um, in the chat GPT, but uh, large language models uh, have been uh, in the research area for a while now. But um, another thing which is happening now is the multimodal that initially vision and language models, et cetera, were you know, independently done uh, research, but now we are combining everything and then we have the capability to roll it out, not only to the elite, uh, you know, um, uh, deep, I mean, research circle, but also to consumers as well. So uh, the reason I want to give this timeline view is when you hear the word AI, just kind of uh, take a step back and try to uh, get the context around whatever task you are doing. That's very important. And when we talk about uh, synthetic data generation techniques, there are essentially, um, I would say three generations. This is a, again, a, a little bit of a historical overview or three types. Uh, the first one is the statistical models. Essentially you are having an input data and then you try to model it with a probability distribution function. And then, um, you know, you sample data out of it. And then came the second generation um, or second type, which is GANs, which is generative adversarial networks. That's also, uh, it generates uh, data, uh, especially uh, around 2015 uh, onward from there, you could see, uh, you know, images, uh, very close uh, resemblance of images it could generate. And that particular technology itself um, is being applied to the tablet data, which we'll be talking about. And uh, uh, not the last uh, is the LLM. Um, it's, this is still uh, in, in, I would say, in the research circle, especially for the uh, tabular data, but there is another type of technology coming in for the third generation of technology for the synthetic data generation. So that will go to the next slide. Uh, so now uh, we, we having understood the term AI itself, that you should think about it where it is being used and what are the various technologies for the generation of data. Let's understand what is synthetic tablet data. So in the literature, you will see more of, you know, image images and voice and uh, language models. But in enterprise, if you see, most of the data is locked in the tablet form. And uh, data science itself, the initial um, phases of data science, uh, always, um, even now, I would say to a large extent in enterprise um, type of situation or even in the learning type of situation, you are organizing the data in the rows and columns, similar to a spreadsheet or a database table. 
but of course the really in the relational uh, model you would uh, also uh, um, you know uh, model the relationship as one uh, one one to one or one to many and things of that nature and we it's a very established field sql has been there for almost forever um, so that is the structure data and that's how uh, enterprise data is predominantly there in that particular form so what we are going to talk about in this workshop is all about the tabular data. So conceptually, if you want to think about it, uh, you're going to generate uh, another tabular data from the original tabular data, which is structurally and statistically similar. So when we say structural similarity, as an example, let's say you have a table with 50 columns and with some specific names of the columns, then when you are generating, that also should have the same 50 columns. So that co corresponds to structural similarity. And the statistical similarity uh, uh, is mainly, let's say, uh, as um, we talked about in the earlier uh, discussion, a particular column, what kind of distribution is there in the original data is the same distribution present in the uh, generated data which is created, which is generated, um, that is synthetic. So uh, if an analyst has a query and they run it against the original data, and that particular query should be able to run as is in the generated data. That means you should not get any syntax errors, you should not get any column names or difference, et cetera. And you should get comparable results when you are running on synthetic data. Remember, it's not the exact uh, copy, right? So you will get comparable results when you are running it on the synthetic data. Then the third part uh, is the utility metrics. These are basically a set of measurements which you run it against the real data and synthetic data to know how good is the synthetic data in comparison to the real data. Right, um, it's not enough you just randomly generated one model and then you're sampling data from that model. How can I explain to the business that this is really good or how can the business tell that you generate data to up to this particular quality? So um, uh, the uh, generally uh, the established uh, techniques of statistical measure, uh, uh, computation is run against both the data to kind of get a confidence level, like distance measures, uh, goodness of fit tests, and privacy metrics, et cetera, are part of the uh, utility metrics component. So with that, let's, uh, uh, I want to flash uh, a couple of um, statistics um, uh, to kind of build the case and uh, for the synthetic tablet data and uh, uh, basically get to know the use cases for the synthetic tablet data. Perhaps most of you may recognize one of your project might have fallen under this statistic. Uh, we develop a number of projects, goes up to the uh, proof of concept stage, or you, know, you learn and you put a lot of effort in the model um, uh, development, uh, but uh, it never uh, goes to the production. Many of them do not go to go to production, especially in the enterprise space, uh, because of various reasons. Uh, some of them, I would say, is uh, data sharing challenges and uh, data pre-processing, which when you're getting uh, the data, it may not be a resemblance of what the data you would get in uh, production once you put it to production as well. So with those type of challenges um, uh, in enterprises, uh, we also have higher level of um, you know, governance structures, et cetera. So many of the projects may not go to production and probably you, you might have seen this in your own uh, work as well. The second uh, statistics is all about data breaches. As I said, I may have more uh, flavor of healthcare in this presentation, but it is uh, required by act, uh, the law that in the, uh, uh, organizations publish any data breach which occur, which impacts uh, people over 500 or more, and it is publicly available. And you can go there and see for yourself uh, the frequency and you know uh, how what uh, the the magnitude of the problem. And especially in COVID, um, the data breaches were a lot more because of the attacks. Um, 
and it was more it went more digital right so uh, uh, automatically the probability of attacks also increased and the cost of data breach uh, breaches are extremely high and uh, in comparison with a uh, data breach for a non healthcare data right um, for healthcare um, i don't know the exact figure but it is quite higher than uh, records from other non healthcare data perspective. So these are really uh, the statistics I wanted to show to build the case for, um, you know, to understand why synthetic data is super important. So the three top use cases um, to reduce the privacy risk. Um, and then um, basically, because it's synthetic, we are not actually referring to a particular individual. And so it reduces the privacy risk. Um, and then acceleration of enterprise AI or in general AI itself. Probably most of you have participated in Kaggle, which is a competition a platform as well as a learning platform as well. You can see some of the uh, challenges or competitions. They will use synthetic data um, for, uh, for underlying because it's diff quite difficult to prepare our data set for competitions and synthetic data has a very important role in that uh, space. Second, when we talk about um, AI, uh, most of the real world data, especially in healthcare, I would add, uh, they are quite imbalanced. Um, it's not that you're going to, uh, as the, as uh, you know, uh, in the earlier uh, talk also we saw, the, uh, the uh, data, some for some aspects you'll have more data and uh, for some aspects we'll have uh, less data and the um, uh, the number of data for rare events etc may not be that much in your original uh, data set on which you're building um, the machine learning uh, models so it's um, you know to address that a uh, very common technique um, is uh, called data augmentation probably you guys have heard about that in data augmentation, what we do is we try to add more data to the data set which is used for training. To uh, give you an example in the space of computer vision, suppose you have uh, you know, cat uh, images, it is very common to transform those like 30 degree rotation or put it upside down or you know, blur the data, those type of processing ahead and then add that data to the original data set and that will be used for um, uh, uh, that will be used for model development and synthetic data is a very suitable uh, kind uh, for data augmentation when you are talking about the tabular data so the the in the acceleration of ai both as uh, you know the skill development uh, at various um, stages uh, i mean many people uh, hold competitions etc and it is hard to get uh, data for competitions as well and for data augmentation it's uh, pretty pretty useful and the third one is uh, improving the software quality so when you are developing some applications uh, probably you got your functional testing done but when you are going to do performance testing uh, you have to scale the data of the orders of ma magnitude. So uh, that's also a very good use case for synthetic data. When we talked about the three types of the generation models, the underlying uh, process uh, is, uh, is uh, it, it has two steps. The first step is always you take the data and then um, uh, convert that to a model, train it and convert that into one model. And then the synthetic data, you actually sample from that particular model. So you can sample n number of samples. So you can vary the n as 10, 100, 1000, et cetera, et cetera. So this is also a very good case for improving software quality uh, to check out this uh, scalability, et cetera, for your applications. There are many, many, many more use cases of synthetic data. But um, for this workshop, I, cho I chose to talk about these three things in um, uh, detail. And in the enterprise yeah, yeah, data strategy, synthetic data is quite a good differentiator, especially for uh, you know, enterprises of various number of data sources. 
and for high value sources where uh, probably many more, many more um, uh, you know, resources are put for, uh, let's say, AI ML development, it would be a great uh, strategy to use this uh, synthetic data as, you know, differentiator, like integrated as part, as part of your um, uh, data strategy as well. So with that, let's kind of uh, go further down. Um, this is a, a very simple diagram uh, to show that you will have, in this particular case, I have again taken as a longitudinal patient data, and this may be di different for different situations. But uh, the point is that you will have data from various data sources. And then perhaps um, in this particular case, I, you had to timeline uh, the uh, various type of data. For example, uh, you may have eligibility data, you may have like you know, clinical data, you may be going to different providers at different points in time, right? So you are kind of combining, connecting, that is part of the pre-processing that happens. And then in uh, the machine learning, uh, when you're doing, you will kind of reduce it to a, like a smaller space, that is the encoding, you'll do the encoding and probably you develop models for prediction. Why I want to show this diagram is the model which you are actually creating for prediction, you should, it is very, it is different and that goes to production for uh, prediction. But the synthetic data is also a model where it actually models the, um, uh, uh, it, uh, let's say, uh, maybe a pre-processed data, like you can do it at uh, different levels, but um, it uh, it is a tabla data on which, uh, you know, you are, um, uh, models may be developed, but we want to create synthetic data on that pre-processed data. So this is uh, just to kind of give you a big picture of how, uh, uh, you know, uh, generally, uh, you know, you, you set up your data for um, developing models. And it is uh, like most of the time we spend in data processing, pre-processing, cleaning or pre-processing. And uh, model development, um, is a tough uh, or it's by itself is another um, task but the more uh, you do on the data side of things the easier or the better you will get the performance results and we are entering the era of becoming more you know data centric versus model centric we have kind of reached um, a point where you know a lot of uh, experiments have been tried out and we are shifting as an industry, shifting the focus from the model centric to uh, data centric as well. But uh, this is a really a high level methodology. Uh, essentially you have three um, stages, plan and prepare, create synthetic data and use it. So again, um, what we do is uh, kind of pick some standard models which are available because not everybody is um, you know, having resources like PhD and things like that. So we always take some existing models, um, either open source or, uh, you know, with some kind of license, we take that model and then you train it for your data and uh, uh, you train it to the level that you define whatever is your success criteria. And then uh, you, you, that will be your model and you use your all your ML ops processes uh, like, you know, model, uh, how do you register a model and perhaps you're developing an API on top of it and things of that nature. But this, these three steps are kind of super simplified and I have given a little bit detail on how you're going to uh, do. The key thing is that we're not uh, starting the synthetic modeling from scratch, but we take it from some existing things and uh, you know you can accelerate your synthetic model on data development. And um, this is a, a, a um, you know an approach for or a, a kind of a framework for implementation depending on your needs. Let's say you are a beginner and you want to just learn the trick of the trade. So then you do the do it yourself approach. So then that's what we are going to do in this workshop. Uh, pick a uh, open source or uh, readily available model, pick your data, pick your um, compute, and then um, you kind of develop that synthetic model and share, uh, create synthetic data out of that. 
and this is quite good for learning and uh, to know the tricks of the trade. And then let's say you have a low hanging fruit kind of a, a project, then you could use um, you know any vendor product, depending on the resources and things like that. Uh, most of the vendors provide uh, SaaS products and they take kind of take care of the complexity of the cloud management, et cetera. And you could use one such thing to just make sure you understand you are getting the business value out of that. And finally, once you're uh, kind of uh, comfortable with that, you, you integrate it to your uh, data strategy. Every, you know, you will have your own data management techniques, et cetera, and then you try to integrate it um, into the enterprise to get the uh, maximum value. And of course, it's quite cost in intensive, but you will uh, get uh, the equivalent benefit as well uh, when it is uh, uh, done right with partnership with business. So this kind of gives a little bit, uh, uh, you know, ecosystem for currently available vendors. And you can see, um, if you see, com compare it with a couple of years back, uh, you can see the ecosystem really um, uh, uh, growing a lot. And uh, here, uh, some of them uh, are open source, the open source that your libraries are available but they also kind of uh, have a commercial version of, of, the, of that and they take care of putting in the cloud and things like that. And you can also see some of them focus on some kind of uh, structure, like some of them may be applicable only for image and some of them in industry, like healthcare industry, um, you know, some of them are tuned for that. But uh, the bottom line is, uh, this is a, a space where is growth is happening and there are a lot of um, companies from startups to established ones. And this is um, kind of uh, growing year to year a lot. And uh, so I want to pause here for uh, a while to see if you have any question, because it's a natural uh, space to move to the next piece, which is um, how do you measure the goodness of the data? Thank you so much for pausing, Janti. A uh, few of the questions that maybe we can take up right now. Uh, of course, you are free to choose as well, but a few that stuck to me is uh, even with de-identified patient data, say because of HIPAA regulations, would we still want to go for synthetic data, especially for healthcare? Yes. Um, the, the, uh, the problem with the de-identified data set is you still have... Uh, let me rephrase the answer. If you go with synthetic data, your privacy risk will be less compared to if you are using the de-identified data. Uh, if you have de-identified data, what we usually do is uh, kind of maybe take out some columns or uh, you might um, uh, suppress uh, uh, age to uh, put it in a bucket and things of that nature. So it's uh, mostly a, a subtraction techniques uh, you are applying. And then if you get a data from other uh, sources, your re-identification risk is high. And also the de-identification, if you have, let's say, 10 rows, if you do de-identify, you will always get 10 rows because we are operating at a row column wise. Whereas in synthetic data, it's not the case. You have some data set, you actually create a model out of it. And then you kind of sample. So you can get 10 or 100 or 1,000 or any number of uh, data rows from that. So the uh, I, I'm, I will say the privacy risk is reduced if you are using synthetic data in comparison with just using de-identified data. Thank you so much, Jayanti. Uh, one more question. Um, I don't know if, maybe we'll already get the answer to that in the subsequent slides, but in case you want to take it. So is synthetic data the same as tokenized or dummy data? No, it is not. Because uh, by definition, um, it, is, it is structurally and statistically similar to the original data. And again, to the point of if you do, um, uh, it, it, it's not, if you have 10 rows of the real data, the output is not just going to be 10 rows. You can get 10 rows because it's a two-step process and you can get 10 rows. But 
it will the dummy data you cannot say that it has the statistical properties which are similar because you might use some kind of a random generator and that's what generally we use in test setups and things like that uh, mostly so again the solution spectrum is why and uh, synthetic data gives you that statistical properties which are quite similar and so the machine learning applications um, if you do it on uh, synthetic data and if you run the same thing on your original data, you should expect similar results and that is called the model compatibility. So it's both structurally and statistically similar to the original data. And of course you're right that I'm going to talk about how do you get a quantify that uh, subsequently, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jayanti. So I think we can resume. I, I see a lot more questions coming in, but I'm assuming they'll be answered in the process. So uh, we can keep it for the end. Yeah. Um, so the part two is, okay, I got something that generated. Uh, I'm very happy with the, uh, that I generated new data. It's very exciting. But how do I know it is good and where can I use it? So that is actually the second part, which is the goodness measure. Um, and again, keep in mind that this is tabular data. So it's a big challenge to articulate the utility of the synthetic data. And uh, generally, you guys, many of you might have seen this um, curve that utility and the privacy are inversely proportional. So technology is there to create synthetic data, but quantifying and then talking to business to figure out, um, give me a number or help them to define a number which represents what is the uh, subjective utility they are thinking about so that we can uh, take that um, uh, as an engineering goal to train the data to that uh, number, right? Uh, to define the success is such a, such a big challenge. Um, and again, this is, again, I will say there is um, uh, still a lot of uh, research is going on in that area. But the cool thing is that we have statistical techniques that once you define the metric, probably it's easier uh, to uh, do and uh, uh, you know you, 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 it can be met. So it is also defined by multiple names, uh, evaluation framework or utility assessment, etc. Basically, um, under the covers, we, they use a proven uh, statistical and practical methods, both uh, you know it can be automated or it can be subjective as well to get a quantitative measure so you can gain the confidence for using the synthetic data. And here, this is also brings the two cultures in the data science, the statistics group uh, camp and the linear algebra camp together. Um, so one camp is doing deep learning and to generate the data and the other camp, you know, you can do um, the, uh, to va va validate and verify whether that synthetic data generated is good enough or not. So let's kind of little bit talk through some of the consideration. We have talked a lot about the structural um, similarity. And then the second one is subjective. What I mean by here is um, uh, uh, the SMEs who are day in and day out in the field um, and who are experts in uh, their uh, area they just know data just like that. They, they get a like kind of a feel for the data. So when you generate the data, but of course they are very difficult to get hold of, but if you can give them to look at the data, uh, it's more a um, kind of a subjective evaluation, but what they can spot right on is, they know the data so well, that let's say there are some derived fields and then there are some threshold limits and things like that they can right away say hey this doesn't look good uh, so even you're implementing some um, uh, systems there are uh, you, you do uh, the database modeling which kinds of takes uh, some business rules into consideration and as a data scientist you may not have visibility for all those things and the people who develop the original systems may not be even there. So uh, people who are data, uh, the domain experts, um, they know the data so well and the subjective or the you know um, free from uh, data analysis, looking at an Excel sheet, looking at some samples, they'll be able to give very good comments about 
how good the data is. It's more subjective. You can't put a quantification on that, but iteratively when you do that, it de definitely improves the quality of the synthetic data you're getting. And then correlations. Correlations, basically you run uh, the statistic both on the original data and the synthetic data, and then just kind of compare whether the correlations are comparable. And uh, uh, next is the relationships. Like when you're doing a relational model, uh, there are um, uh, statistical models like copulas, which can kind of get uh, the foreign key relationship or you know one to n and one n to n type of relationship. And whether such relationships are preserved in your synthetic data, that's also another thing you want to uh, confirm before releasing the synthetic data out, out. And of course, privacy is really a big deal. And I'm going to little bit talk a lot more about that um, from conceptual perspective. And uh, many times, uh, you know, we you may have to work with your data boards and things like that. But sometimes we, as uh, engineers and data analysts um, who are in the field, may not uh, have uh, the framework to ask the required questions. So I want to give some conceptual um, uh, framework here to uh, kind of have the conversation between your data board and probably they may be they may or may not be with a uh, in collaboration with the legal team etc depending on the size of your company but uh, understanding the privacy uh, concepts uh, as a data analyst or a machine learning engineer is a uh, is a good skill to have so so as i said the subjective uh, assessment um, uh, by domain expert and uh, I, let me just kind of share another um, metric, this, uh, how, how the metrics are defined. And uh, you can uh, uh, understand what I'm talking about, like what does that mean by running a, a data statistic on that? And then also another method you can do is many organizations share uh, summary statistics. And you can kind of, if, if your data is of that nature, you, you can uh, compute the summary statistic from the synthetic data and compare it with the publicly available uh, system as well. So let's see the definitions for um, metrics. So I'm kind of using, this is an open source uh, for uh, personal use. Um, the, uh, this is uh, sdv.dev. Uh, I have been working with it for a while, so I kind of understand this. Uh, but different uh, companies may have their own way uh, of doing, coming under the evaluation framework or assessment framework or anything of that sort. But uh, if you could look at the uh, this particular um, library, it also has visualizations also as part of uh, the, the library of ecosystem. They have a lot of Python libraries. And SD metrics is one of them. And that also has visualization, et cetera. But let's kind of look at what do you mean by, um, you know, when you have a tabular column, right? You can have single column, like you can feel, <coughs> you can see what is the distribution around that column and what is the boundary adherence. When they say, when we say boundary ad adherence, whether the, the comparing the match changes, yeah. Uh, hi, Jandi. I think we are uh, we are not seeing the new screen that you're sharing with the demo. Are we still on the slides? Oh, yeah. I see. you What's may that? have to stop sharing and reshare again. Maybe your whole screen. Uh, yeah, maybe you should share with the Can you see now metrics glossary? Yep. Okay, so um, here in the tabular column, uh, tabular data, you can see. You can run stats at a single column, or you can run at column pairs, which is more the correlation uh, deal, which uh, was talked about in our earlier presentation. And then uh, single table metrics, like do you have exactly same data from the original um, uh, data set? That means you, you are overfit the data. That's not a good thing. So that kind of uh, uh, computations you can run. And then you can also have the multiple table. This is about the relation, when you're modeling the relational um, uh, data, it's not that you will have only one table, you have many table. Then you will have relationship 
across the tables. So these are kind of uh, uh, categorization of how you can uh, automate your uh, metrics report uh, across a single column. And these are the measures which are um, defined by this uh, particular uh, tool. But uh, whatever tool you're using, it will have its own thing, or you may have to write your own, um, your own uh, metric as well. And then do the uh, compute to run on the original data and the um, uh, synthetic data. Similarly, um, you, they, they all, all also have uh, some kind of uh, reports built for you uh, across all these uh, uh, metrics. I'm not going to go over um, everything, but the idea is for a tabular column, uh, tabular data, or single table or multi-table, you can do across columns, you can do column pairs, you can uh, do it across the entire table, and you can do across the multiple table that at a one uh, at a higher level, and you can go uh, in depth uh, about uh, the. Uh, you can check out the range. You can check out the missing values whether they are similar, um, in, in the sense like percentage of missing values whether they are similar, and then between the columns maybe you look at the correlation similarity and things of that nature. So I uh, just wanted to give a high level. And the cool thing about this is uh, based on your domain, based on your interactions with your, your business, um, uh, after you are on the same page with this kind of a metric, you can define your own new metric. That's so cool, uh, which can be done for uh, any particular industry or things like that. So such is the value of um, this uh, goodness measure. And that is very important. And your synthetic data will not be successful unless we get to this. Uh, 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 you can kind of explain that the synthetic data is uh, similar and how similar, and you're quantifying that. So, with that, let's kind of get to my presentation. Um, let me share my presentation screen now. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, let's kind of look at another uh, area, which is the privacy area, which I kind of uh, talked to you. So privacy enhancing technologies is uh, really an ecosystem of technologies. Uh, there are many, many in number, uh, many, many uh, approaches. Um, some of them are operating on the data. Some of them will add some noise to the data. And some of them will uh, be algorithmic, and some of them uh, work on kind of securing where the code gets executed, et cetera. And synthetic data is one of the emerging, uh, you know, privacy enhancing technology. And you can see in uh, the NIST also, they, they started kind of mentioning this. And tokenization and anonymization has been in existence uh, quite mature technologies, uh, I would say. And then differential privacy is uh, uh, like you add some noise to the, the data and then kind of do the uh, summary statistics. When you're doing the summary statistics, you may, it, it makes sure that uh, one particular data element is not affecting your summary statistic and thereby it uh, gives a quantification for the privacy. So. Although there are many are there, I'm not going into details of that, but um, the point here is that synthetic data is one of the, uh, one of the favorite pet, I would say, <laughs> in the system of uh, technologies which help to minimize uh, privacy risk or enhance the privacy on the data sets. Um, and uh, to just kind of uh, get a idea of uh, what, how do you kind of think about it, uh, disclosures, uh, 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 under the umbrella of disclosures, which is like you should uh, it should not have disclosure is basically you're uh, sh showing the data or things like that, right? You want to minimize that, but how do you categorize that? Is identify identity disclosure, attribute disclosure, and inference disclosure. Um, in and these are very helpful to understand when you're talking about privacy to. Um, a different uh, domain uh, people, and then you are able to translate uh, what they are saying. They speak to the data speak basically. So identity disclosure is that you a third party cannot identify a subject 
meaning your first name, last name, email, like that, it should not get uh, uh, disclosed that they're able to identify that particular person. And attribute disclosure is that you are learning something new, extra information, or you are estimating at a, with a very high confidence level, that is attribute disclosure. That is you're learning a little bit more uh, about uh, something. Uh, for example, suppose you are having some kind of um, uh, so, uh, summaries about some hospitals, etc. And if by uh, if, if you are releasing the data and by somehow you, you say all the patients are like less than 18 years old, then you can kind of conclude that it is a uh, you know um, most of the patients are children. So that kind of attribute is additional information. Think of it as an extra column information. And that inference uh, disclosure is where this machine learning um, uh, comes into play, where you can either uh, you know somehow figure out what was there in the uh, original data set, uh, like member inference attacks or some of uh, the common um, things. Uh, for to understand this, you have to first put the hat of a kind of a um, uh, you know, attacker, and then it is easier to understand these. But having an uh, idea about this is very good for conversations and coming up with that uh, measurement uh, with your business um, for your uh, synthetic data. And uh, if you think about how it minimizes, I'm really underlying the word minimize. Uh, while there is um, um, uh, there is a minimum risk, like nothing is foolproof, right? So for identity attribute disclosures, unless it is really overfitted, the identity disclosure is quite low. And then um, inference disclosure, again, um, uh, fitting a model uh, on the synthetic data, right? It is, um, even if you if a member attack happened on the synthetic data, uh, because it's uh, kind of a synthetic members, um, you, you, you're, you're not doing too much damage. So that's how, uh, these things play. And uh, let's kind of go to some demos. Um, so what I did was I, I, um, I ran the uh, tutorial from uh, the SGV on my, um, collab uh, area uh, and uh, kind of captured the results so that uh, uh, remember all these deep learning uh, techniques, they do take time. So to uh, kind of save some time, I ran that before and then I'm just um, I'm going to walk through this. So again, as in any notebook, the first one is to install the corresponding libraries. So this, uh, the SDV is one such library I'm using. Uh, and then you will you install the library, and then um, you you load the data um, as usual. In this particular thing, the data set is again uh, just for uh, um, privacy and all that. It's actually a fake hotel guest with a single table. So that the purpose of this demo is just to understand the processes involved creating synthetic data, and not to too much worry about the data itself. And here you can see the guest email is the primary key, and that becomes um, the key for your, you know, uh, identity for this um, uh, data set. And you are just kind of looking at the data here, and well, you have to give the metadata um, that is describing each of the columns and what is the type of it, and perhaps defining what is the primary key. As per whatever this your tool. Um, uh, recommends or a tool mandates, right? This is something a specification uh, you you do once and uh, you describe your data from there. And uh, uh, basic usage is that this particular library has a number of models. You pick a particular model in this particular case, it's the CT again, and then um, uh, send in your metadata, and then you fit. This is your training uh, thing with the real data. So when you're doing this, you may have some questions like, oh, when I do machine learning, I do it like I split the data, what, what is happening here like that. 
But here you don't need to worry about those type of things because we're not actually building the real model which does the uh, predictions, right? It is, we are creating a model which is resembling the data. So you can, the more data you have, the more better you are. And how we are going to check whether it is good or bad is by running that some as uh, the statistic across both the real data and the um, synthesized data. So this one, I want you to think about. Many times I get questions and when you're thinking about it, you get confused between the actual model you are developing versus the synthetic data model, which is the representation of the data. And then once uh, you have trained it, then you, uh, you can sample. This is what I said, sample. So you can have just 10 rows or 100 rows or 1,000 rows or whatever it is. That's how it is different from other, uh, uh, some of the privacy um, enhancing techniques like uh, de-unification, et cetera, because we are not operating at the column level on the original data. You are first doing a modeling and then sampling, and then uh, that your, is your synthetic data. And here also, as a part of pre-processing, you can anonymize your uh, the key information. In this particular case, uh, this is an example of to anonymize the addresses and uh, um, emails, et cetera. And this is again a separate library within the ecosystem of SDB. So that in your, um, uh, uh, you're pre-processing the data uh, ahead. Um, and then uh, this is the evaluation part, which is uh, how uh, run the statistics across the real data and the synthetic data and the uh, give the metadata for both. And this sometimes takes quite a bit of time uh, because uh, we are running all the metrics as a default. And But the, what this gives good is that with one score, you get a feel for what is the um, you know, goodness. Suppose if it is 50% or 40%, then you, know, you need to change something in your training. And um, it, they also have um, mechanisms or capabilities to visualize your uh, data as well. So um, once you have done that, you can save the data, save the model basically. So once you have this, uh, once you're happy with the evaluation report and all that, you can actually save the model as a pickle file. And you can do two things. You save the model as a pickle file and then provide a service so that you're doing on-demand generation, or you generate predefined samples and then give that as your uh, you know, uh, product, whatever, right? So the bottom line is that the you get a model and then you can later on sample from that particular model. And uh, as I said, let's say, let's say you're not very happy with your report. What things you can you do is you can do the adjust the hyperparameters of this model. In this particular case, you're customizing it with the uh, epochs, um, and it does take a long time to run. Um, GANs are very compute int intensive, and that's why I kind of run it for you uh, for this workshop. And um, again, you can run the report. Um, so that I wanted to cover both the steps, and you can. Uh, do what uh, uh, different ways of you know um, uh, making it into different components and things of that nature depending on your resources and what kind of service you want to provide and things like that. So with that, I'm going to stop here and uh, take questions. Hey, uh, there is time. I think you may not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think there's time for one or two questions, maybe real quick. And for the rest, uh, you can go ahead and type in the question and uh, the answers to the questions in Q and A. Uh, so Shruti asked that. Uh, I think it's Shruti, right? So uh, what you uh, talked about today is mostly about tabular data, but can we use similar synthetic data generation for, say, uh, vision or uh, even like NLP, uh, what video data? Yeah, yeah. I mean. Actually, the technology came from vision only, the GANs. Statistical model, yes, it is very much on the uh, relational table. And it has been in existence forever, 50 years like that, right? Statistics is quite a matured. Of course, the advances are always happening, but it's quite a matured field. And we have been running estimations and uh, all that. Um, uh, those are nothing new. 
but the gans the neural network technology like that architecture that initially started in computer vision primarily and of course if you see the history of llms there also the neural network is the baseline right so uh, it is there actually the, the newness is only in bringing the technology to tablet data rather than uh, bringing it back to the other side basically yeah all right thank you jayanti uh, maybe one last question before we move to the next one uh, what percentage of variation should we retain in synthetic data to ensure that it's not an exact replica of the original data um i think it depends actually this is uh, this is really the hard question and the challenge um challenge i have faced it is very difficult to articulate the goodness of the data right that variation really refers to that goodness of the data right so depending on the end goal meaning you may at the, at the end of the day you might want to develop some kind of a machine learning task on that or things mm -hmm. like that right so depending on the end goal in consultation with your business that's really the key <laughs> it's hard okay. um it's really hard but i would say this quality uh, metrics gives a overview and a rough goal and sometimes uh, depending on the nature of the data and the nature of the things um, uh, suppose it say you are going to do uh, software um, uh, test data or things like that then your structural compatibility is lot more important than the statistical measure for example you want to independently develop uh, the sql statements by someone else then your structural compatibility is lot more important right so i i would say that's a really hard question to answer so at a big level you have these type of quality reports which gives you uh, overall what it, it is and then you need to fine tune it as per your needs all right thank you so much jenty and thank you again for walking us through this very very relevant topic especially as we move as we move toward privacy concerns and responsible ai i really appreciate you uh bringing this topic uh, into the wits workshop and sharing your wisdom with us so oh, thank you it was a great honor and an opportunity to talk to all of you and please uh, feel free to um you know message me in linkedin if you have any question and um, i'll be glad to answer them thank you for the opportunity and thank you for your time yeah thank, thank you jayanti i want to acknowledge the pioneers uh, women pioneers in this field um, uh, who have uh, given inspiration natanya swini cynthia artwork uh, and the top list of women um, uh, engineers data scientists researchers who are uh, really giving the inspiration and moving this field forward thank you thanks jayanti Thank you.